So welcome everybody uh, to the panel. Uh, thank you so much for the very inspiring talk and I think it will start a lot of conversations, not just in this hour, but they will continue um, at Purdue. <laughs> and so um, for those who are just joining, um, a very brief maybe introduction, a very brief introduction of our um, Purdue Engineering uh, Distinguished Lecture Speaker, uh, Dean uh, Yanis Yortsas, so um, is a dean of uh, Viterbi School of Engineering and Zorab Kap Kaprelian Chair in Engineering um, at University of Southern California. Uh, Dr. Yortsas holds PhD uh, in Chemical Engineering from Caltech and um, has a degree in Chemical Engineering also from National Technical University in Athens. Um, you know, among his um, Recognitions very recently, including at the same time as the as the, uh, becoming a recipient of uh, Gordon uh, Prize. I understand that you also received a prize in filmmaking. You were recognized for a, um, a documentary that uh, you were executive producer, I think. N not uh, filmmaking. Uh, I just gave the money for the things to happen. <laughs> Um, that actually is one of the, I think that gives a, a really good topic um, that we, or a really good example of how we can bridge the societal forces in uh, engineering. Um, the documentary called uh, Lives Not Grades received the uh, LA Area Emmy in uh, 2022. Yeah. Um, and then I'd like to introduce uh, our colleagues, panelists. Um, so, uh, so Siva, uh, Sivtha Raman um, uh, is assistant professor in industrial engineering. Uh, Siva has joined Purdue in 2022 uh, from Texas A&M, uh, where she was at the Research Institute for Foundations of Interdisciplinary Data Science. Um, she was PhD in electrical engineering, so we're bringing... Uh, uh, different fields of engineering to address this very um, big questions that you have highlighted. Um, from University of Notre Dame and the master's and undergraduate degrees also from electrical engineering from Indian Institute of Science and PES Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, she was uh, research interests are at the intersection of control theory and machine learning for distributed decision making in large scale cyber physical uh, human systems, very relevantly, with applications specifically to transportation networks, power grids, and interdependent infrastructures. So thank you, Shiva, for participating in the panel. Um, and uh, next, uh, David Bernal is an assistant professor of chemical engineering uh, who joined Purdue also very recently in 2023, uh, coming from Research Institute uh, of Advanced Computer Science at USRA and uh, uh, jointly appointed at the um, Quantum Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at NASA. Um, David received uh, his PhD in chemical engineering at Carnegie Mellon and baccalaureate uh, degrees in physics and chemical engineering from Universidad de Los Andes in Colum Colombia. Um, David's research interests are in optimization software and theory, quantum computing, as solution methods to problems in combinatorial optimization and chemistry, chemical and process systems engineering. So thank you, David, for joining the panel. Um, and um, um, Kan Lee, assistant, I also like to introduce uh, Kan Lee, assistant professor of chemical engineering, who joined Purdue in 2022 from Polytechnic Montreal after getting a PhD in chemical engineering, also from Carnegie Mellon, and baccalaureate degrees in chemical engineering from Tsinghua University. Um, Ken's research interests are in algorithms and software for optimization under uncertainty, machine learning for discrete global optimization and applications to sustainable energy system design and operation. So thank you all for joining uh, this panel discussion. Uh, maybe we'll start with a couple of opening questions. So. Um, Kind of building up on what you have described uh, of uh, trust and purpose as really kind of 
putting that forward as a um, framing for future uh, engineers. Um, can, can maybe kind of the, maybe you start and then the panel uh, shares how, um, how we see, um, you know, how we contribute um, to that um, engineering plus, um, you know, what does this concept mean to each panelist and how can it be implemented in engineering education and practice? So maybe how your research and how your um, perspectives uh, contribute to that engineering with purpose. Maybe starting. Um, okay, I'll, I'll repeat. <laughs> um, so, I think that we are facing a society, a global society, some um, significant problems that come, I think part of them has come from the fact that technology has moved so fast. And as a result, you know, clearly the issues of, I mean, we, we talk about climate, that's, that's an important part of that. But there are other things that have come out from inequality in terms of, you know, way people live in different parts of the country or, or the world. At the same time, we have to agree that many good things have happened, and I'm, I'm, not, an, I'm not a pessimist about that. You know, standard of living has improved across the world. Uh, extreme poverty has been reduced dramatically. Uh, extension of, of life has, 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 has increased. Human suffering has, 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 has decreased in many different ways. So um, at the same time, you know, this, the, 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 there is something undercurrent of, of um, new issues that have come up. And I think that the world also is going through a deficit of trust. Uh, and I don't know if this has come because technology has allowed people to express uh, polarized opinions that make people, uh, or maybe disinformation and misinformation that actually contributes to that. Um, sometimes, I mean, nowadays, and maybe in the foreseeable future, one would have to ask the question, is this really is real or is it not real type of thing, right? So this trustworthiness has to come up and understood. So there has to be some arbiters of this truth, right? And, you know, I don't think we can trust today the existing politicians who tell us the truth, right? Because, you know, they are driven by, by things. Maybe there will be some person that comes up and says, you know, that people will, will, will agree that, you know, very trustworthy. So, I mean, um, uh, professions like engineering, it is not, I mean, you know, the conversation about engineering has not changed dramatically. You know, I think many efforts have been made to change the conversation, and they have stumbled a little bit. One of the reasons, I think, is that we don't make, us, we're not asserting ourselves in that. Because if you think about the technical competence that exists, it's unparalleled right now. Um, and you know, when you talk about, let's say AI, we leave it up to others to explain it. We are the people that can explain what AI is, right? We know how things work. We know what's a neural network. We know how the computers play with billions of parameters to fit something. There's an optimization process there. There's a curve fitting in some way. And you know, and then you know, the concept of having artificial intelligence or sort of a, a kind of a consciousness and everything. You know, th these are important things. We have to take a step and advocate those. At the same time, people need to trust that what we're, do we're saying is right. So how do you develop this trust? I think it's a matter of, um, first of all, getting our, our students to understand that, that this is part of their responsibility to develop this. How do you develop character, right? I mean, character is, is, is taught in medical schools and it is thought, let's say, in religion type of thing. Well, maybe we can borrow from what's going on in medical schools and say, how do you trust, uh, develop character in medical, I mean, medical schools, you have to make sure you don't kill people. You know, there's the, hypo, the Hippocrates oath. Maybe there's an oath that is needed for us to be able to get there. And I think that may be something to, to consider. Um, 
about engineering plus um, X that uh, Dr. Uh, Yorsos uh, proposed. For me, coming from a background in uh, systems and, and control uh, you know, theory, uh, sort of the systems viewpoint is something that underlies that whole uh, concept. And um, studying systems that are inherently sort of complex, nonlinear, and if you start thinking about the implications of all that from you know, whether it's a system like the, the grid or the transportation or society as a whole, uh, it's a very humbling, um, you know, thing to study systems because you then start realizing that what you're doing is a little bit of, uh, you know, something that has, you know, secondary effects, tertiary effects, so many, you know, things that are interlinked. And I feel that, um, for me, one of the things um, that I try to kind of put into my research as well as convey to students is, uh, is the scope and magnitude of the kind of uh, interactions mm -hmm. in the systems that we are addressing. And, uh, you know, kind of, and I think, I believe that that should make a person humbled and a bit more centered when they start, you know, thinking about uh, their role in this, you know, in, in this uh, technological society and transition. Um, and coming to the issue of, of trust in particular, um, I feel that it is our sort of duty more so today than ever to uh, educate the public in mm. an aggressive and relentless manner because uh, there is a lot of, you know, mysticism, for example, around AI. Uh, if we look at it today, people are, AI is going to go conscious, AI is going to make humanity extinct. So, you know, we as engineers, we see this as, you know, okay, training a neural network, this is an option problem, this is, you know, doing a certain thing. Uh, so I feel that kind of putting out the right version, uh, the more nuanced and correct version uh, of the truth out there, how much, you know, you know, whatever effort it takes, we have to keep repeatedly doing that uh, to kind of, uh, you know, remove some of this um, misinformation, mysticism that's, that's coming about. Um, and I feel like that would reduce uh, the polarization that Dr. Yorsos, uh, you know, talked about. Because once you understand the, the complexity of the system and the nuances involved, there can be no scope for binaries in this. Because all of these, uh, you know, they're, they're not, you know, simple yes or no, against or for kind of, uh, you know, concepts. They're a lot more, you know, complicated. And it is our duty to kind of uh, educate uh, the public in this, in this uh, context. Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, I, um, uh, I'll go ahead. Um, many of the things that Dean Yortos mentioned, I, I fully agree with them. Um, I would say that many of those exponential advances in society that we have seen, they have been driven by engineers. Uh, and certainly, I think that this is a result of a specialization in our, in, in our career. We have become experts in a very particular, and some might call it tiny, uh, corner of knowledge. And some of the challenges that we are addressing, or that we need to address uh, rather uh, quickly, require more of a systematic approach instead. Um, I think that a university is the perfect place to maybe take that step back and, and think a little bit outside of the box. Uh, you're surrounded by a lot of talented people that are thinking about other parts of, of these massive problems. So um, we keep talking about multidisciplinary efforts. Uh, so this engineering plus X, uh, the, I, I'm glad that you use X because you can replace anything into X, right. right? Including auto engineers. Um, so <laughs> so I, I think that uh, in order to, to uh, like a, a clear message towards uh, two engineers, um, in, including my students that are in the audience, uh, is that we, we need to address some of these challenges by using some of the knowledge that our colleagues in other buildings, in other labs, in our buildings, in our departments, in other branches of, of knowledge are, are doing. Um, I think that um, this will also, uh, now addressing the second part of the question, which is how do we, how do we incorporate this into a more, into how do we have society trust us more? I, I think that part of this mistrust comes from maybe a feeling that we're detached from reality. We might, uh, the ivory tower kind of 
uh, concept that, that is all over the place that we are so engulfed in our, in our, mm -hmm. in our corner of the world that, that we don't care about what happens to, 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 to the rest. Well, it's on us in order to, in, in order to try to tackle these things, um, these challenges. Uh, we need to go out there, as you mentioned. Um, we, need to, we need to work on things that matter, work on things that might have effect on others' lives as, as soon as possible. So the, the challenge is out there. I think we know what to do. It will take some effort, but I guess that's where we are here. So yeah. Yeah, I guess I just want to uh, echo what the other panelists and Dr. Yusos has already mentioned. So maybe I will uh, talk about in two major aspects. One is generative AI's impact. The other is uh, sustainability. It has to be the two areas uh, you know, I have been focusing on since I started my career at Purdue. Uh, so one of the aspects, as uh, Dr. Yusos um, already mentioned, you know, generative AI and so forth are accelerating at, at exponential speed. Uh, and it start uh, making us questioning what will be the technical competence students would meet, uh, need to master these days. Uh, so I was very shocked, for example, last year when I made my, uh, the, the final exam of one of my undergrad class, I was surprised ChatGPT can score 100% on my uh, final exam. So it start uh, you know, questioning us, besides technical com competence, uh, what would engineer has to be, uh, be able to master? Uh, so would, I would argue that uh, the engineering class would be a very important concept that besides the, the technical competence, uh, engineers has to be aware of that, uh, the intellectual curiosity and also the societal responsibility that uh, the engineer needs to have. So the other thing uh, particularly important for the chemical engineering discipline would be sustainability. Uh, I guess uh, one of the misconceptions the public have with the chemical engineering as an occupation is that we made a lot of emissions, right? So it is also our jo uh, job to you know, kind of communicate to the public we not only create uh, emissions, we are going to solve the problem with the technique like reaction engineering, mass and energy balance, uh, and so forth. So I think in, in terms of education, uh, we need to train our students such that they are aware of this technical, not only the technical stuff, but also the uh, societal responsibility they can communicate to the public and really make an influence in the real world. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. So it looks like there is an emerging uh, sort of uh, theme uh, of uh, trust and communication, right? The communication piece. And um, it's actually uh, v very timely. We just launched uh, a first class in engineering for public service and was looking up a uh, definition of what is public service. I think going back to uh, Thomas Jefferson, he defined it as public trust. Mm. And there are 14 general principles of public service that executive branch of US government um, actually follows as uh, mm. go going back to executive order from, um, I think, President Bush um, uh, senior. And they are enshrined in law. This is basically how you build public trust, mm -hmm. uh, including de disengaging from from like never, never deal with issues that you have personal financial interest and so on. So, we're, so maybe one of those communication vehicles would be bringing more tech talent, engineering students, into public service, mm -hmm. um, yeah. into government, uh, local, state, federal, including, you know, as far as I understand, uh, out of a... Uh, 535 members of uh, 118th Congress, um, single digit is engineers. And it's probably on us, on engineers, that we're not out there communicating with the public and building trust. Um, and from what I understand, there's more talk show hosts yeah. in Congress than there is uh, engineers. <laughs> so maybe engineers need to be a little bit more like the talk host or the, or the movie makers. Yeah. Me. Or, but it, it, you know, it's probably a role for everyone in there. Um, so, kind of the second question, speaking of the movie, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that documentary. Yes. And I want to ask, that kind of make it a question to all of us, is um, you have this, the title of the movie is, uh, the documentary is Lives Not Grades. And in that regards, how do we teach with an emphasis on Affecting 
human lives rather than um, worrying about the grades. And, um, and you know, I think the, there is a quote in the movie by one of the uh, one of the instructors uh, in that class. I think it's based on a class. Um, he says that this is, you know, this is about impacting people's lives for real, not writing papers. So education both in the undergraduate sense as well as PhD, engineering, PhD, education. How do we make an emphasis on lives, not, mm -hmm. not uh, grades or papers? Sure, I can tell you a little bit about how this came about. <clears throat> um, we wanted to teach a class that uh, is human-centric uh, and um, looks at uh, how do you solve uh, problems of, uh, you know, some human-related problems of people in crisis. That was the, the idea. And that class uh, was uh, engineering-oriented, but we also had students from outside engineering who came in. And the idea was, what if we look at, for people at crisis, being so in, in the Greek island of Lesbos, which is very close to Turkey, uh, there were a lot of refugees who were in refugee camps because the policy of the European Union with respect to refugees is they are to be apprehended in the country that they are first arriving, and then they have to process in a different way as well. So Greece was the first place to do that. Now, the... So the selection of this island had nothing to do with me. I did not, was not invited to go to Greece. They didn't ask my opinion. Uh, however, they came to me and they said, uh, would you be willing to support uh, the trip of some of the students there? And I said, uh, how much will it cost? <laughs> and so they, <laughs> they gave all these things anyway. I said, yes, we're going to do that. So the idea was customer discovery. So it's almost like a startup. How do you create a startup? One of the things you do is start customer discovery to figure out what are the needs of these folks in order to create. So the original idea of the student was, well, let's try to develop some real technological solutions to solve these problems, right? So they were gaho. A number of the students actually they didn't even have passports to get there. It was the first time they would go outside the country. So they ended up going there, and when they visited this, this refugee camp, they realized that many of the ideas they had were completely off because, you know, the real problems of the people on the ground were very different. And on the, so they, they did two trips. The, they went there to see the customer discovery, then came back, developed some sort of technology solutions based on what they saw on the ground, and then they went back again to, to implement them. Some of them were very... Uh, successful. Uh, one of the, comp of the ideas actually became a, start a real startup company called Frondida, which is a Greek word for care, actually. It was, it was done by non-Greek people, but anyway, that's how it's called. And it's still actually uh, uh, active. And, you know, they try to figure out what impact they have. The, the, trans the experience of the students was transformative because none of them has been dealing with this in the past. Uh, this class, by the way, has been repeated uh, in, the future, in, in other uh, situations, and the next class we try to do this is to try to address this, the homelessness problem, which in Los Angeles is actually very acute. Mm -hmm. um, so they came back, uh, the whole thing was actually uh, filmed, and then you know, became a, a short documentary that was, the PBS was interested, they published it, actually it's a web, we can look it up on the web, and you know, then they recommended it for, uh, they, they submitted it as an independent project at the Emmy, Emmy Awards at Los Angeles uh, area. And lo and behold, they got an Emmy, and you know, a number of them was got an Emmy, I got an Emmy, like, take the person, like, hey. <laughs> um, so that was the whole concept behind it. Um, so two things, um, first, you know, it's easy to go and come up with solutions without understanding what the problem is. They were willing, the purpose they had was how do, so, how do we help these people? And I think that's really what they went to do that. Um, and second, um, 
it was very useful for them to understand how they can tailor their engineering uh, uh, competence in order to solve specific problems. And so the purpose was, let's solve, help these folks, and then how do you get this? So I think that was help them develop empathy. They have develop uh, also some humility for them because they went there with these grandiose ideas and all of a sudden they realized that this is a very different thing that they, they thought. You know, because, uh, so, um, anyway, that, that, that was the whole concept of, of, the, of the class. Um, they did it last year by going to Ukraine to figure out, you know, the plight of refugees from U Ukraine as well. It was not, so, so the, this was uh, um, e equally uh, um, uh, impactful for the students, although it did not uh, result into any, you know, uh, cinematographic uh, kudos uh, because they, they didn't go forward to that. But so this was the, this was the whole concept that, that they, they followed. Um, the, the fact that, actually this also changes the conversation about what engineers can do and, and, and what they're capable of. And I think um, the uh, PBS that saw the thing realized that as well. So that was actually a good positive move in that direction. The program was also supported by the Engineering Foundation, so they gave us some money for that. And then the rest came from my office, so yeah, that's how it worked. So, the other thoughts about uh, lives, not grades, uh, papers and approaches to infuse that um, purpose and trust in engineering education? So um, one of the things is uh, if you have to um, convince an 18 or 19 year old uh, you know, person, we've all been that person, to look beyond the, the grades, then uh, the question is to go back and see how the system is set up and how the incentives in the system are, are set up, right? So if um, I'm hiring a PhD student or I'm hiring a postdoc or I'm hiring a faculty here, Am I looking beyond the grades? We have to ask ourselves this kind of critically, right? Am I really looking at what impact they've had? Am I willing to kind of uh, look at their contributions in various aspects that go beyond the paper? And I think the honest answer, unfortunately, in the academy today is no, uh, largely. Uh, it's changing, but still the answer is largely no. And, you know, I teach, uh, you know, a subject called, called reinforcement learning where you kind of train AI models, you know, by designing rewards that, that help them achieve, you know, it's kind of train them to mm -hmm. behave in a certain manner, right? So our rewards are, are basically, you know, collecting lines on a resume today, uh, you know, at whatever stage we, we look at it. And unless that kind of fundamentally uh, changes, uh, I don't know how far we can kind of um, influence students to think beyond the page, think beyond grades and, and so on. So in that context, um, you know, initiatives like the one that you just, you know, spoke about where you go and talk to, you know, real people, you see that there are, you know, larger issues in, in society beyond, you know, an A on your transcript. Uh, it, it really, again, it humbles a person. Um, and I hope that when some of these people go ahead and you know become, uh, you know, come to positions of of leadership, that they will take that uh, knowledge when they are you know redesigning this system for the future. Maybe we didn't do it in the past, but maybe that awareness will help our engineers become future you know better leaders for for the future, and maybe kind of uh, you know reform uh, some of these incentive structures that we have put in place right now. Well, I, <clears throat> I'm, I am certainly adding something to my watch list, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, and and this, this whole discussion makes me um, reflect that, that uh, since this is so inspiring, maybe the way uh, I, I will address maybe another part uh, of the, of the, the pipeline uh, here, which is at the recruiting level, if this is so inspiring and we feel like so connected with this kind of ideas, um, maybe um, this is a marketing issue when we want to recruit people into engineering. 
Um, should we, as, as, as Tsen was mentioning before, like uh, people might not be aware that instead of us being part of the problem or even the problem makers, uh, we, we can be the problem solvers. Is this, is this gonna be, um, uh, um, how can we communicate all this to our prospect students uh, in order to, to recruit them into these challenges that, if anything, they require hands. Mm -hmm. we, we, we need more people working in this, mm -hmm. in, in these grand challenges. So that is a, a quick reflection that I, that I had um, inspired by this. Um, I, I think life is pretty good, but it could be better. So mm -hmm. I sort of disagree with the title. But, um, but, but let me watch it first, and then I'll build <laughs> a, a better opinion on this. Yes. Sure, uh, I will just uh, add upon what the panelists have already said. Uh, so regarding education, of either at the graduate or undergrad level, I think beyond the, the papers, the grades, one of the things I think students benefit a lot is to collaborate with uh, some industrial collaborators. So we have some very successful programs at Purdue. For example, at undergrad level, we have this so-called VIP program. I had the pleasure of working with some undergrad students together with the oil and gas company. They were using AI to solve a very challenging problem the oil and gas companies are facing. So I guess the students will get a different perspective of uh, how technology work at the at undergrad level. And similarly, at the at graduate student level, besides writing the, the papers that are uh, publishable in you know, the uh, best profile journals. I think doing some internship in industry also helps students uh, grow a lot. I personally benefit a lot uh, when I worked in industry uh, for one summer. And not just about to saying how the technology works in practice, but also, uh, I mean, even to experience the bureaucracy and, and the inertia in industry kind of uh, give you a perspective how to make a real impact in, in the real business. Uh, I think that that is something uh, we never learned uh, within the university. So I, I think that, that that's something I would encourage students to do. And uh, I guess we have very good programs at Purdue for students to, to grow in that perspective. Thank you. Um, well, especially since we have um, experts on uh, optimizing under uncertainty, I want to throw this question. So it's often very difficult, if not impossible, to predict effects of technology. Even if sometimes, the, uh, you know, invention becomes very widespread and the immediate impact is positive. Um, for example, take refrigeration, mm -hmm. right? Uh, 1920s, search for safe refrigerants, mm -hmm. you know, CFCs, cl chlorofluorocarbons, this is... Yes. Okay, chemical engineering uh, <laughs> connection. Um, they were an apparent safe, non-toxic yes. refrigerant, Refrigeration became very common in, as a result of refrigeration. Um, the incidence of some cancers went down significantly, like stomach cancers were very high. The life expectancy increased. And then in 1980s, we realized that it created a, a ozone hole. Right? So, so some of these effects are very nonlinear and very difficult to predict, and actually they go to this geological planetary scale. So. And um, on the other hand, there are some, sometimes we, we have this aversion to technology. Mm -hmm. um, maybe AI is in that stage. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of, you know, some of those uh, considerations of, like, AI is going to replace so many jobs, it's actually based on the, on the view that there is a constant demand, but mm -hmm. we will create lar larger and new value. And so how do we deal with this other, especially since we have quantum, uh, I guess quantum technology connection and um, AI, generative AI and more and uh, compute, how do we, other critical and emerging technologies, including space, uh, now, how, how do we approach this very large um, uncertainty in the eventual effect of technology? Well, with respect to the, um, you know, the fluorocarbon situation, um, I think society uh, acted relatively decisively on that. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe because there was not Maybe there was some leadership out there to do this. Maybe uh, there was not a lot of interest in that. 
Uh, maybe people realize that you can do refrigeration without them. And so I don't think you can predict in advance the deleterious effect that will happen. But I think the honest and transparent thing is the moment you realize this, to sort of try to address them and then get done. And so uh, I think so transparency in communication will be an acceptance of this would be very important uh, for that. Um, and this, I think, where scientific publication and, and integrity of that is very, very important. Um, nowadays, you know, I happen to be the editor-in-chief of a new journal of the National Academies called PNAS Nexus, which is the, a little bit propaganda here, the first uh, ne uh, journal of, of the academies in 114 years. And I see all kinds of, it's multidisciplinary, so I see all kinds of, uh, you know, abstracts and very fascinating in many different ways. But at the same time, you see an explosion of publications in many different ways in journals. And you ask yourself the question, how uh, serious, not serious, how rigorous are some of these so that you, to be able to actually follow them? So there's a little bit of, of, a, of a question mark there. But in this particular case, that we, I think actually it's a good example that people actually reacted relatively fast. Mm -hmm. Acid rain is another example, you know, where actually I don't believe we have this anymore as part of society. So, you know, we acted on that. Um, climate, it's a much less compelling uh, uh, story in terms of, you know, how we are acting to that. Uh, and so the hope is that maybe we'll wake up and do something about it uh, as, a, as a society altogether. Um, with respect to uh, AI, um, I think because of the fact that change is so fast and potentially, you know, you can have unintended consequences that are not predictable at this point, um, I think it's important to have some sort of a, not watchdog, but some, 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 some informed uh, uh, folks who follow this and be able to come up with recommendations that can be applied. And to me, uh, AI has another important uh, element to it, which is there is a concentration of the ability to use AI. There will be to small uh, numbers of people because it requires tremendous resources, uh, including energy for that matter. And the question is, how do we make sure that this is socialized across the world so that the, the typical person can also use it and benefit from it in some way. So I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that this is democratizable as easily as other things in that, but maybe, maybe I'll, I'll be wrong. I think it, it, it benefits to have an informed uh, and serious a group of engineers, for the most part, uh, who can then understand the the implications of this and the ethics associated with that, maybe some ethicists who should be there. Uh, that, 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 that would be my recommendation if, if, if I, but you know, at the same time, you know, we have to think about the fact that different societies have different values and how do we make sure that this is uniformly applied. There has to be some sort of a, I don't know, United Nations or equivalent approach to, to figure out, you know, that this is something to, to think about, just like what happened with the um, with uh, atomic weapons, which in some sense uh, he had similar possibilities for mm -hmm. unintended consequences, or at least from, from that perspective. Um, it is fascinating. So I have been on record by saying that generative AI has been a triumph of human ingenuity, and I, I, I believe it. The fact that we're able to capture this incredible amount of knowledge and have something that brings it in our hands in such a uh, uh, feasible and, and, and way to do things is incredible. Uh, however, because of the same principle, you have to think what exactly are these other consequences that can come up as a result of that. So we do need some, some serious thinking about all, all these other things as well, uh, even though you know, hallucinations do happen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, 
it's a new world. Um, our challenge will be to make sure we don't fall victims of, you know, some of the false, or not false narratives that are very, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting a lot of eyeballs about things that are can become weird and all that, and make sure that people do not get off the rails in in some some way that this is that's that's out of there. So, yeah, that's some on, sanity on <laughs> AI and quant quantum or any other emerging. Well, I I I. You said quantum, I had to speak. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 I think in, in general, like, my opinion is that fear should not, should not be on the way of progress. Uh, we, we need to be cautious. That does not mean that just, we should just stop uh, pursuing, mm -hmm. uh, addressing some of these challenges. Um, I think Although uh, we have like this deal that I don't talk about the stochastic optimization, he doesn't talk about quantum. <laughs> I will, I will um, get into into uh, Tan's uh, area of expertise because uh, some of the slides that you showed with this, with this, uh, with the progress of time, how ideas can like unintended consequences can arise from ideas, even if you plan. If you try to foresee every kind of a scenario, something might go get out of control. So it just having like tight control on this and pruning those unintended, um, unintended consequences, that is a, a very uh, structured and um, I don't know mathematical way of approaching it, right? Multi-stage stochastic optimization, <laughs> we would call it. Um, so. Uh, this applies if, among many technologies to quantum, right? So uh, I, just because um, some people might have um, some, might be cautious about this new kind of technology, we should pay attention. We should uh, make sure that it doesn't get out of control, but it should not forbid us from trying to make advances in, in, those, in those directions. And, and I think that that constant you said reinforcement learning, right? So we need to constantly be measuring our system and making sure that it stays on track, that we implement those, those guardrails that you, that you were mentioning earlier. That's, that's my take on this. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent quote. Uh, uh, fear should not stand on the way of, uh, of purpose and you know, linking back to the virtues. And uh, so it's one of the Aristotelian cardinal virtues is yes. courage. Yes. So we should continue with courage, uh, pursuing purpose. So maybe um, questions from the audience? Um, so I wanted to pull on this thread of, so this notion of using feedback to continually monitor a technology or the pruning which analogy, which I really liked in terms of using regulation becomes this tool that you use to protect against or correct against these things. As an engineer, completely logical, makes perfect sense. The, again, the problem in my understanding seems to be that number one, again, that, that was a process that, you know, one, the people who are doing the pruning are often not engineers. Um, and there's a huge disconnect there. And now there's a temporal disconnect as well because the technology is moving so quickly. And in fact, either you, I think you get one of two situations where maybe there are engineers or scientists who would, you know, I'll use autonomous vehicles as an example, where you, we have a, I would say, policymakers have not done their response, you know, not met their responsibility to appropriately make laws or uniform laws across states. And so I think car companies and other companies sort of say, well, I'm just going to keep going then. I'm not going to you know, allow that to stop me from making progress, um, which I think you can debate, but is maybe justifiable. Um, then the alternative is that you have um, engineers or scientists or technology makers who don't care, you know, just want to do what they want to do. And then you don't have policymakers moving fast enough to keep up. And so that mismatch. Um, to me is sort of completely crippling our ability to deal with any unintended consequences regardless of whether people care or not about them. So there's, there's a character and purpose issue. I think there are people who don't, I don't think we're teaching engineers to 
think about the consequences as much as they could. Mm -hmm. And then even if we care about it, we're crippled in, in terms of handling it. And I feel like I keep hitting against this wall and I would love to hear practical thoughts on, on how to address that. That's a big question. <laughs> um, maybe the way to look at this is that I'm not sure we do the same thing in other cases. Uh, so, you know, although <laughs> I, I've been changing my mind a little bit about that with respect to, you know, the, the, the way the current society works, which it's a bit dysfunctional, if you think about it. Um, it would seem to me that if it was about a matter of life and death, okay, maybe, uh, I mean, at least in the past, let's go back 20 years maybe, uh, you will get the expert person to, to come and make that decision. In other words, the politicians will stay aside and say, you know, here's the expert to do this. Today, that, that, even that actually may be, may be a little bit uh, uh, under you know, assault. You know, some people feel that politicians make decisions about life and death and not <laughs> leaving it to the experts of, <laughs> for life and death. Um, so I think there is a, there is a, a overall um, f something that needs to be done across the board. And so it's a bigger problem. I, I, I agree with you that this is a, how do we come up with some specific practical steps on, on addressing that? And it looks to me that this is a bigger problem than than simply, you know, convincing. I, I think there is a there is an undercurrent of political uh, acrimony, perhaps, that doesn't allow this to function normally. And we need to go back to that, to that, because if you think about it, there is nothing real about it. The only real about, thing about it that you could say is that. And I think, so, you know, um, uh, Yuval Harari, I don't know if you know him, you know, a historian, a Israeli historian, very, you know, he wrote, uh, you know, a homo, homo, homo sapiens and, and all, the, all other things. Very interesting. Uh, uh, he has mentioned that what we are going in, what, what you know, science, uh, because it's global and because it's universally true kind of thing, is not suited for people that look for a tribal uh, 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 story. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of maybe society is, is in the form of tribes and they love to hear a tribal story that pertains only to them. And science does not pertain to only a tribe, but pertains to everything. And I think some of it has to be uh, attributed, this type of, of, of disconnect, I think, is attributed to what we see today in the world. So the question is, how do we get around that? And how do we make sure that people can have their tribal story, but get science above it to, be, to drive the, the, because I think, we be, all believe that science is the truth. I mean, well documented. Uh, tribal stories are more attractive because you know it's the story that a mother tells their their child, and so they, there is always this this element to it. Uh, so there is a, a, a um, uh, uh, an element there that has to do with uh, human, uh, uh, you know, anthropology to some extent. Um, it's an interesting question, and I don't know how one would address it, but to me, that is actually the fundamental uh, thing that is going on right now. We have created, you know, different countries have different tribes in some sense, and everybody believes in their mm, mythology that sometimes eliminates science from the conversation, and I think that whereas we are all believing that science is applicable globally, and you know there is no difference whether science applies here at Purdue, 
in West Lafayette versus in Johannesburg, South Africa. You know, it's the same. So I think there's a bit of that. So unless we tackle that, maybe we're going to have difficulty going through it. So, you know, it's a matter of changing that. I don't know what uh, Yuval uh, Harari is going to is saying about this now, but definitely he articulated about a couple of years ago, and I was reading this and I said, yeah, he's right, you know, so. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak, uh, since we're in a university and we're talking about, you know, public universities and private universities and research universities, if there was any advice you might be willing to give to leaders of universities, to, to, I'm sorry, to what? leaders, no. uh, to the leadership, to help presidents, deans, presidents, deans. <laughs> uh, I know we have one over there, <laughs> uh, uh, but also I'm interested from the because um, we also have assistant professors, right? Mm -hmm. So that you're going through that. Um, so how how should university leaderships change the way? they run universities and the way they address um, these type of big questions. Uh, I'm not sure it is on everybody's mind. Uh, I think it depends on the state you're in and all of these things. But what, how, how would you advise them? Thank you. I mean, my, my position is that, um, you know, transparency and accountability to some extent uh, has to be practiced pretty much every day. Um, you know, there are, as you know, in many, and we saw it very clearly at the spectacle of the three presidents that presented there, a lot of university leadership is trying to follow a legalistic answer to pretty much everything. And I think what you saw there was an attempt to uh, appear as, a, as if you were defending yourself in a court of law where people, everybody knew this was a court of public opinion. And legal stuff was completely irrelevant, but you can tell the people behind. And I've been there myself because sometimes when you are in a sensitive thing, the lawyers will tell you, no, no, don't do this, don't do this. You know. So I think the legalistic society that we live in sometimes forces people to sort of a, avoid taking a position of moral stature and then you know, make, make the case for that. And I think ultimately that's probably a solution to this because universities are supposed to lead younger people. And if the message we send to younger people is like, hey, that sometimes don't talk, you know, legal stuff, you know, keep, keep I think is, is, a, is not a positive reinforcement. Um, and you know, Higher education is under assault right now. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we give the right answer to this uh, by emphasizing the values that, true values that, you know, uh, exist and should exist in a university system that has always been open to debate, open to, uh, uh, you know, opinion and the pursuit of truth. So I think. You know, I mean, universities are very special places for that. And right now, I'm worried that, a little worried that, you know, you see these attacks that to try to, you know, move it into something that, that did not exist uh, before. So it's, it's something to, to um, so, so some, this requires some courage as well. For the most part, good leaders will show that. Uh, and so hopefully, that's something that, that uh, people have learned to, to apply across the board. And, uh, you know, I think this competence and character thing should be important. Uh, you need to be competent at that level, and also you have to, to have the character to defend it. And uh, so eh, sometimes it's not easy because, you know, whatever you say is going to be very uh, scrutinized and also perhaps <laughs> dissected and then take this part and put it there and this part put, put over there. But uh, if you're genuine, I think, um, you know, you should be able to withstand this uh, criticism type of thing. That's my position. What about you guys? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> 
I think virtues are necessary. So there is some, in, and you've mentioned that. I think some, some reflection and some, at least maybe, um, you know, we are all engineering PhDs. There is a philosophy part. And philosophy, <laughs> philosophy is based on some system of virtues. Yes, right? of course. And whether we agree or, you know, whether they, they don't have to be universal, but there needs to yep. be some, um, some at least reflection and understanding of what, yep. you know, what the systems of virtues are. <laughs> Uh, true. I was uh, listening to uh, Jane Goodall the other day, uh, who was talking about, you know, what living with ch chimpanzees have taught her, and you know the, you know the, the ability to preserve, you know, n natural world as it is and all that. And that's actually a very important message that comes from someone who devoted her life entirely on this, and has no particular, you know, bond to. Uh, uh, to pick here, it is uh, so. Um, yeah, I think it's. Uh, it, 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 and, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that you know, we live in a in a world where I, I, I mentioned this double helix, which I think is going to be the case. The question is, how do we do this in a way that is productive and also help us propagate a a, uh, or, or, or promote a future where humanity and the natural world are going to, to, uh, to flourish in many ways. I think that's actually our challenge right now. Uh, and you know, some people say that, well, you know, when you deal with AI, and for instance, and all that, it's, it's actually part of our um, planetary system. Not planetary system. Well, AI computes, I mean, I mean it's about uh, instructions that are given to computers which are made out of silicon or whatever. These are part of life, you know. So there's, there's not an exotic element that has come out here. So sometimes people say, well, that's actually, philosophically, that's part of the planet kind of thing, which I suppose there is some, something right to that. Um, how do we move to a new state that emphasizes and, and, and makes this a harmonious way to live? I think it's, it's an interesting challenge. And, and uh, you know, I don't think we should, we should let philosophers or whoever are to dictate that. I think we should take their uh, advice and help, but I think we are capable enough to be able to do that uh, and, and figure out how to do this right. So that's my, my take. <laughs> Yeah, I think we are uh, out of time. Thank you for making us a little bit more cam ca uh, you know, capable of addressing <laughs> those issues. And, uh, yeah, I'm, very I'm, sure this, I'm very optimistic about uh, humanity. Yeah, those conversations will continue. It was very, very fruitful. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah.